thank you to everyone, both staff and pupils in all years, who've put so much time and effort into uh, hearing and reciting poems. Um, and obviously, we just have the tip of the iceberg here, but I know there were many excellent uh, poets who unfortunately got knocked out at the semi-final stage. We're fortunate enough to have uh, Ms. Willis from the pre-prep judging for us this morning. And uh, hopefully there'll be time for her to say a few words at the end without giving away winners. Um, as old hands will know, we have section winners for year three and four, five and six, and seven and eight, and an overall winner. So without further ado, we're going to year three. Smile by Spike Milligan. Smiling is infectious. You can catch you like the flu. When someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. Uh, when I walked around the corner and someone saw me grin. When he smiled, I realised I passed it on to him. I thought about my smile and realised it's worth. A single smile like mine can travel around the earth. So if you feel the smile begin, don't leave it undetected. Start an epidemic and get the world infected. Television by Roald Dahl. The most important thing we've learned so far as children are concerned is never, never, never let them near your television sets. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. In almost every house we've been watched and gaping at the screen, they loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. It rots the sense in the head. It kills imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He can no longer understand. A fantasy. A fairy land. His brain becomes as soft as cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think, he only sees. So please, oh please, we beg, we pray. Go and throw your TV set away. And in its place you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. And later, each and every kid will love you more for what he did. Wind on the hill by A. A. Mill. No one can tell me, nobody knows, where the wind comes from, where the wind goes. It's flying from somewhere, as fast as it can. I couldn't keep up with it, not if I ran. But if I stopped holding the string of my kite, it would blow with the wind for a day and a night. And then when I found it, wherever it blew, I should know that the wind had been going there too. So then I could tell them where the wind goes, but where the wind comes from, nobody knows. So thank you very much. That was Hadley, Isabella and Dylan from Year 3. Now we are on to William and then Wilbur from Year 4. Awful Day by Dave Crawley. I had an awful day at school. My teacher made a fuss. I didn't hand my homework in and then I missed the bus. A barking dog just chased me home. Oh no, I've lost my key. I'll crawl through the window. Ouch, I think I scraped my knee. The television doesn't work. I can't take any more. But now I see that Melanie is strolling through the door. She rubs her head against my legs and I am no longer sad. Suddenly, my awful day is really not so bad. Oh. No animal is half so vile as Crocky Walk, the crocodile. On Saturdays, he likes to crunch six juicy children for his lunch. And he especially enjoys just three of each. Three girls, three boys. He smears the boys to make them hot with mustard from the mustard pot. But mustard doesn't go with girls. It tastes all wrong with cats and cows. With them, it goes extremely well. His butter scotch and caramel. It's such a super marvellous treat. 
and boys are hot and girls are sweet. At least that's Crocky's point of view. He ought to know. He's had a few. That's all for now. It's time for bed. It's time to rest your sleepy head. Shh. Listen. What is that I hear? Clumping softly up the stair. Go lock the door and fetch my gun. Go on, child. Hurry, quickly, run. No, stop, stand back. It's coming in. Oh, look, that greasy cream skin, the shiny teeth, the greedy smile. It's Crocky Walk, the crocodile! Thank you, Wilbur. Now we're over to Jasper, then Joseph from year five. Boring by John Whitworth. I'm dead bored. Bored to the bone. Nobody likes me. I'm all alone. I'll just go and crawl under a stone. Hate my family. Got no friends. I'll just sit here until the universe ends. I'll starve to death and all the bones. Then I'll be dead. Dead rotten. Less than a block that's been more blotten. Less than a teddy bear that's been forgotten. Then I'll go to heaven. But that's more that can be said. So for certain persons, when they're already dead, they'll go, you know where, instead. Then they'll be sorry. Then they'll be glum. Set on a stove till kingdom come. Then they can all come kiss my... Hmm, that sounds like swearing. You shouldn't swear. I want to go to hell, and I don't care. I don't care. I'll sit here and swear. So there. Except that's boring. A Snake Ate All My Homework by Laurie Degman. A snake ate all my homework, Mom. I swear to you, it's true. It swallowed it with one big gulp. It didn't even chew. I chased it to my brother's room. It headed straight for Pete. It ate his high top sneakers and the socks right off his feet. It gobbled up Pete's football pants, his soccer shirts and shorts, his baseball bats and catches mitts. I guess the snake likes sports. I, it slunk into the bathroom. Poor, poor dad was in the tub. It drank the water, soap and all. It gurgled, glub, glub, glub. My dad slip slided, gave a yelp and wrapped up in a towel. But not before the snake escaped. So dad joined in the prowl. We tracked it to the kitchen. It had opened up the fridge. The only things it didn't eat my mother snaps the bridge. There it goes, my father called. It's heading towards the door. We had to catch that snake before it swallows any more. Suddenly, I thought of how I'd get my homework back. I gathered the supplies I'd need to launch my sneak attack. I grabbed the jar of pepper and the box fan from upstairs. I aimed it at the snake and said, I hope you said your prayers. I sprinkled pepper near the fan. It floated on the breeze. It sprayed the snake right in the face. Achoo! Wow, what a sneeze. The sneeze was so gigantic and it knocked me to the ground. And everything came flying out. It scattered all around. I found this on my neighbour's lawn. I'm here at school on time. So now my homework isn't late. But please excuse the slime. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're through to year six. And we're starting with Sam and then having Charlotte. Will you walk into my park, said the spider to the fly. Tis the prettiest little park that ever in its park. The way into my park is up a winding stair, and I have many curious things to show you. Oh, no, no, said the little fly. 
for of, of doors me is in vain. For who goes up your winding stair can ne'er come down again. I'm sure you must be weary of it, with soaring up so high. Will you rest upon my little bed? said the spider to the fly. There are pretty curtains drawn around. The sheets are fine and thin, and if you'd like to rest well, I'd snuggle it up you in. Oh, no, no, said the little fly, for I've often heard it said, they never, never wake again if you sleep upon your bed, said the cunning spider to the fly. Dear friend, what can I do to prove the warm affection I've always felt for you? I have within my pantry a good store of all that's nice. I'm sure you're very welcome. Will you please to take a slice? Oh, no, no, said the little fly. Kind sir, that cannot be. I've heard what's in your pantry, and I do not wish to sleep. Sweet creature, said the spider, you're witty and you're wise. How handsome are your gauzy wings, how brilliant are your eyes. I've a little looking glass upon my parlour shelf. If you'll step in one moment, dear, you shall behold yourself. I thank you, gentle sir, she said, for what you're pleased to say. I'm bidding you good morning now. I'll call another day. The spider turned him round about and walked him to his den. For well, he knew that silly fly would soon come back again. So he wove a subtle web in a little corner slide and set a table ready to dine upon the fly. And then came out of his door again and merrily did sing. Come hither, hither, pretty fly with pearl and silver wing. Your robe's are green and purple. There's a crest upon your head. Your eyes are like the diamond bright, but mine does Alas, alas, how very soon this silly little fly, hearing its wily, flattering words, came slowly flitting by. With buzzing wind, she hung aloft, and nearer, nearer drew, thinking only of her brilliant eyes and green and purple hue, thinking only of her crested head. Poor foolish thing, at last, up jumped the cunning spider and fiercely held her fast. He dragged her up his winding stair into his dismal den within his little parlour, but she ne'er came out again. And now, dear little children, who may this story read to idle silly flattering words, I pray you ne'er give heed. Unto an evil counsellor, close hearts and ear and eye, and take a lesson from this tale of the spider and the fly. Little Red Riding Hood and the Wolf by Waldo. As soon as Wolf began to feel that he would like a decent meal, he went and knocked on Grandma's door. When Grandma opened it, she saw the sharp white teeth, the horrid grin, and Wolf, he said, may I come in? Poor Grandmama was terrified. He's going to eat me up, she cried. And she was absolutely right. He ate up in one big bite. The grandmama was small and tough, and Wolf wailed, that's not enough. I haven't yet begun to feel that I have had a decent meal. He ran around the kitchen yelping, I've got to have a second helping. Then added with a fight for Lear. I'm therefore going to stay right here till little Miss Red Riding Hood comes home from walking in the wood. He dressed himself in Grandma's clothes. Of course he hadn't eaten those. He dressed in Grandma's coat and hat, on went shoes, and after that, he even brushed and curled his hair and sat himself in Grandma's chair. In came the little girl in red. She stopped, she said, and then she said, Grandmama, what big ears you have. All the better to hear you with, the wolf replied. But Grandmama, what big eyes you have, said Little Red Riding Hood. All the better to see you, the wolf replied. He sat there watching her and smiled. He thought, I'm going to eat this child. Compared with her old Grandmama, she's going to taste like caviar. Then Little Red Riding Hood said, But Grandmama, what a lovely furry coat you have on. That's wrong, cried the wolf. Have you forgot to tell me what big teeth I've got? And no matter what you say, I'm going to eat you anyway. The small girl smiles. One eyelid flickers. 
She whips a pistol from her knickers. She aims to attack the creature's head and bang, 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 she shoots him dead. A few weeks later, in the wood, I came across Miss Riding Hood. But what a change, no cloak of red, no silly hood upon her head. She said, hello, and do please note my lovely furry wolfskin coat. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're on to year seven and we have James followed by Miles. The Sea by James Reeves. The sea is a hungry dog, giant and grey. He rolls in the beach all day with his clashing teeth and shaggy jaws. Hour upon hour he gnaws the rumbling, tumbling stones and bones, 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 bones. The giant sea dog moans, licking his greasy paws. And when the night wind roars and the moon rocks in the stormy cloud, he bounds to his feet and snuffs and sniffs, shaking his wet sides over the cliffs and howls and hollows long and loud. But on quiet days in May or June, when even the grasses on the dune play no more their reedy tune with his head between his paws. He lies on the sandy shores, so quiet, so quiet, he scarcely snores. Television by Roald Dahl. The most important thing we've learned, so far as children are concerned, is never, never, never let them near your television set. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. In almost every house we've been, We've watched them gaping at the screen. They loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. Last week at someone's place, we saw a dozen eyeballs on the floor. They'd sit and stare and stare and sit until they're hypnotized by it until they're absolutely drunk with all that shocking, ghastly junk. Oh yes, we know it keeps them still. They don't climb out the windowsill. They don't fight or kick or punch. They leave you free to cook the lunch and wash the dishes in the sink. But did you ever stop to think, to wonder exactly what this does to your beloved tot. It rots a sense in their head. It kills the imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He cannot understand a fantasy, a fairyland. His brain becomes as soft as cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think, he only sees. All right, you'll cry, all right, you'll say, but if we take the set away, what shall we do to entertain our darling children? Please explain. We'll answer this by asking you, what used the darling ones to do? How used they keep themselves contented before this monster was invented? Have you forgotten? Don't you know? We'll say it very loud and slow. They used to read. 
they'd read and read and read and read and then proceed to read some more. Great Scott, glad Zooks, one half their lives of reading books. The nursery shelves held books galore, books cluttered up the nursery floor. And in the bedroom, by the bed, more books waiting to be read. Such wondrous, fine, fantastic tales of dragons, gypsies, queens and whales and treasure islands and distant shores where smugglers rode with muffled oars and pirates wearing purple pants, sailing ships and elephants. Oh, books, what books I used to know, those children living long ago. So please, oh, please, we beg, we pray, go through your TV set away and in its place you can store a lovely bookshelf on the wall and start to fill the shelves of books, ignoring all the dirty looks, the screams and yells, the bites and kicks, and children hitting you with sticks. Fear not, because we promise you that in about a week or two of having nothing else to do, they'll start to feel the need of having something to read. And once they start, oh boy, oh boy, you'll watch a slowly growing joy that fills their hearts. They'll grow so keen, they'll wonder what they've ever seen in that ridiculous machine. That nauseating, foul, unclean, repulsive television screen. Later, each and every kid will love you more for what you did. Thank you, Year 7, and now we're through to uh, our last two candidates, Kyle and Henry for Year 8. Snake by D. H. Lawrence. A snake came to my water trough on a hot, hot day, and I in pyjamas for the heat to drink there. In the deep, strange scented shade of the great dark carob tree, I came down the stairs with my pitcher. I must wait, I must stand and wait, for there he was at the trough before me. He reached down from a fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow brown slackness, soft bellied down over the edge of the stone trough and rested his throat upon the stone bottom. And where the water dripped from the tap, in a small clearness, he sipped with his straight mouth, softly drank through his straight gums into his slack long body, silently. Someone was before me at my water trough, and I, like a second comer, waiting. He lifted his head from his drinking, as cattle do, and looked at me vaguely, as drinking cattle do, then flickered his two forked tongue from his lips and mused a moment then stooped and drank a little more. Being earth brown, earth golden from the burning boughs of this earth on the day of Sicilian July with Etna smoking. And the voice of my education said to me, he must be killed for in Sicily, the black, black snakes are innocent, the gold are venomous. And voices in me said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now and finish him off. But I must confess how I liked him. How glad I was he had come like a guest in choir to drink at my water trough and depart peaceful, pacified and thankless into the burning bowels of this earth. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I longed to talk to him? Was it humility to feel so honoured? I felt so honoured and yet those voices, if you were not afraid, you would kill him. And truly I was afraid, I was most afraid, but even so, Honoured still more that he should seek my hospitality from out of the dark door of the secret earth. He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily as one who was drunken and flickered his tongue from his lips like a false night on air, so black, seeming to lick his lips and slowly turned his head and slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length curving round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face. And as he put his head into that dreadful hole, and as he slowly drew up, 
snake easing his shoulders and entered further. A sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole, deliberately going into blackness and drawing himself after. Overcame me now, his back was turned. I put down my picture, I picked up a clumsy log and threw it at the water trough with a clatter. I think it did not hit him, but suddenly that part of him that was left behind convulsed in undignified haste, wreathed like lightning and was gone into the black hole. The earth lipped fissure in my wall front, at which in the intense still noon, I stared with fascination. And I immediately regretted it. I thought how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. I despised myself and the accursed voices of my human education. And I thought of the albatross, and I wished he would come back, my snake, for he seemed to me again like a king, like a king in exile, uncrowned in the underworld, now due to be crowned again. And so I missed my chances with one of the lords of life, and I have something to expiate, a pettiness. Henry V at the Siege of Harfleur by William Shakespeare. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favoured rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gold rock. Overhang and jutty his confounded base swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fet from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonour not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, Show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble lustre in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England! And St. George. Thank you very much, Henry. Wow, follow that. Uh, perhaps Mr. Webster will recite for us and do so. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the uh, lockdown special of the perennial favourite.